Welcome back to my channel. I'm JC and today's video is going to be a master class video. Um, you guys voted. So LeVar Burton, the power of storytelling, won the vote. So that is who this wonderful master class is from. I am actually surprised. Um, I went into this master class expecting one thing and I got something different. Um, I mean, it's still about storytelling, yes, but I didn't realize it would focus more heavily on the vocal storytelling side the like reading the books at an event reading out loud to you know to a room full of people which should have dawned on me because it's LeVar Burton and that's what he is famous for reading to the children and <laughs> to people so um and, but I know he's also a writer so I kind of thought it would be focused more on the writing side but um I got a lot out of this class because um, if you guys don't know I am terrified of speaking of public speaking um it's what took me so long to live stream um but I got a lot as far as if I were to do events in the future um and I also hate reading out loud to a room full of people but he gave some good tips and points and things to do in preparation to um to go through in order to get yourself ready and prepared for that kind of thing he talked a lot about why it's so important and why you should want to perform um orally in front of people and tell stories that way through oral rep through oral communication and um he talked about podcasting in which i did not know he had a podcast so that was very helpful and he also um gave breathing exercises on one of the lessons um and i just it was really it was mind opening opened my mind you yeah. know what i'm trying to say um, it it was it opened my mind to a different way of viewing storytelling um not that i ever didn't understand that it was important to hear the stories um but i suppose i didn't really understand the importance in being able to communicate orally the stories uh because i am not i am not a good orator at least i don't think so so but i think after this class i could be a good orator um, without further ado, this is LeVar Burton, teaches the power of storytelling. See you on the other side. We are natural born storytellers. We've been telling stories since the dawn of civilization. It began with cave paintings, and as time passed, it blossomed into oral storytelling. That gave way to the written word, which meant we could preserve our stories. This morphed into the age of the cool fire, television, and movie screens, which has now led to the digital age of storytelling, allowing us to share stories with the world at the push of a button. We all have that experience of having been read to when we were kids. And there's something really uniquely human about that lap experience, having someone who loves you focus their attention on you around a story. And the information that is transferred in that lap experience goes way beyond the content of the story. We are transmitting an inheritance. In this course, I'm going to help you identify your personal story and how to communicate that story to the world. I'm gonna to touch on reading aloud and public speaking. I'm gonna to touch on exercises that you can do to enhance your sense of relaxation, which is really important for a storyteller. I'll cover podcasting and storytelling for children, storytelling for adults. Mostly, I think it's really for anyone who has a need to communicate at any point during their lives a message, a story, or an idea. Anything that you learn here, you will be able to apply to every single aspect of your life. All of the communications you have at home, at work, in play, 
all of it will be valuable in helping make you a more effective communicator. I'm LeVar Burton, and this is my masterclass. Videos are the newest way of performing a very, very old art, telling stories with music. It's really important to me to pass on that which I have acquired and accumulated as information, knowledge, wisdom, to pass it on to the next generation. In my first days as an actor, I worked with heroes, legends, Cicely Tyson, Maya Angelou, Lou Gossett, and they passed on to me the benefit of their knowledge and their experience. So it's my turn, really. My first audition was for the miniseries Roots. Roots changed my life in every way conceivable. Not only did it launch my career, I started in this business at such a high level of storytelling. I never wanted to make a habit of dipping below that standard. It's given me every opportunity since then, every challenge that I've taken on, every success that I've had, all of it has come as a result of that first job as Kunta Kinte. The actual telling of the story of, of Black people in America and the, our period of enslavement here in this country really gave me a foundation for and a boldness to embrace equity and social justice as something that I was willing to speak out about. I think Roots gave me a foundation and a platform to be a social activist. And I don't take that lightly because when I was growing up, I saw Harry Belafonte, Sidney Poitier, Ossie Davis, Ruby Dee, Sammy Davis Jr. All of these actors, actresses, and entertainers, they were all on the front lines of the civil rights movement. Because I have this platform, um, I feel that it is necessary and incumbent upon me to use it responsibly, but to use it. Stories are the universal language of humanity. It's the desire to communicate. It's not rocket science. Really, it's not. It's giving a damn. It hasn't been all of that long that I have been um, willing to claim the title storyteller. It's something that I believe that I have grown into over time. There are so many different ways to storytell. In my own career, um, I storytell as an actor, as a director, as a writer, as a producer, uh, as a podcaster, as a public speaker. There's storytelling through dance, through music, through um, painting. What being a storyteller means to me is one who is willing to take on the responsibility of bringing stories to the people. I believe that the stories that we tell one another are the foundation and set the parameters for who we are as people. We are continually telling each other our stories. I'm always aware of the audience that uh, I'm in front of and what what the message is, what's the purpose for the story? Is it to um, inform? Is it to educate? Is it to entertain? Is it to enlighten? There are so many different outcomes we can point ourselves to um, in the process of storytelling. Self-knowledge is key to finding your authentic storytelling nature because you know, they say as a, as, a, as a writer, write what you know. As a storyteller, it is essential to know oneself in order to have that authentic 
place from which your story flows. And the, the good ones, the great ones, all know themselves incredibly well and spend the time, put in the work necessary to discover all aspects of who they are. The journey of humanity is about finding our way through the darkness toward the light. The story of my life and, and, and how it has shaped um, the storyteller in me, uh, I, I think is an interesting story because if you look at my career, I've been able to portray human experience through these vastly different characters in hugely disparate circumstances. And being able to play those characters successfully, authentically, is where the rubber meets the road. What makes the difference is the intention behind the story, right? What is it that you want to say? And, and where is it from your personal experience that lends credence, that lends weight, gravitas, reality to the story that you're trying to tell allowing your personal experience to be a part of your storytelling is what helps round out your storytelling persona when i, I started my professional career i realized that as as a black man i couldn't just make my living doing one thing, right? I'm not the sort of guy who can do anything that he wants, you know? You look at, I don't know, people like Kevin Costner, you know? Um, white males who just have all of the opportunity in the world. I'm not that guy. I've been able to develop other skill sets, other methods and methodologies of storytelling. It was on Star Trek The Next Generation that I, I became a director, a writer, and then a producer a public speaker, I have developed all of these modalities of storytelling in part out of necessity because I couldn't just do one thing and make my living. I had to diversify. And I think that, that artists these days um, are aware of that because as an artist today, you have to handle your own social media. So you're telling stories there every day. I have been purposefully exposed to all kinds of stories throughout my life. And I'm happy to say most of them live inside of me. And that's, you know, that's sort of the magic of stories that, that we take them in and they become literally a part of us. Okay, so in lesson number one, he talks about um, being an authentic, authentic storytelling. Um, he says that a storyteller is one who is willing to take on the responsibility of telling their own stories. And he says, suggest that you not be afraid to call yourself a storyteller. Um, it's like a storyteller have to have to have a message in the story to the tell. What is the message? What is their purpose? And I also talked about using um, our own lives and our own human experiences and to create intention behind the stories that we tell. He also said that self-knowledge is key in authentic storytelling and that we must discover ourselves, um, good or bad, in order to tell good stories. And remember that there is just as much um, importance in the dark side of a story or the, the you know the bad side tragic side of a story as it is to the positive or the light side of the story he also said um and as far as being authentic storytelling don't be afraid to diversify your experience um gain different skill sets don't he talked about how he realized you know a long time ago um, being being black in Hollywood, he was going to need to be able to do more than one thing, more than just acting, more than just um, writing, more than just being a good orator. So, you know, these are some things that he combined in skill sets and he took on many different skills to 
diversify his experience in the industry to propel him forward into a better career. Next lesson. What does it mean to connect with an audience? What it means to me is that you are consciously creating a moment of communion. That that connection, your ability to reach out, right? And draw someone in with the story you're telling and with your instrument, literally drawing them in with everything you've got, with the words, with the silence, right? That's the whole point of storytelling. You want to make that connection with who it is you're talking to. When I'm doing a hosting gig, like Reading Rainbow, it was important, it was necessary for me to learn how to relate to the camera. Because as an actor, you're taught, never look at the camera. Don't look at the camera, the camera's not there. But if you're communicating through the camera lens, you need to be comfortable looking down the barrel of the lens. One of the things that helped me was to imagine the face of someone and talk to one person. Make that imaginary connection with one person. I used to visualize my son, Ward, when I was doing Reading Rainbow, and I would address everything to him. And in sort of narrowing my audience down when talking to the camera, to one person, it made my task really digestible. I could talk to one person. I can successfully make contact with one person. And in doing that, I was able to speak to thousands. Now, when you're addressing, say, a room full of people, one of the things that I like to do is to make eye contact with different people in the audience, maintaining contact with, this, with the text. But when you look up, look specifically, meet eyes with someone in the audience. And that's a surefire way to make sure they're engaged because if the audience sees you looking at someone, the thought going on in their mind is, he may be looking at me next, so I, 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 I want to be there. I want to be present. I want to make sure that I'm able to meet his eyes should he come to me. You want to make sure that they're with you. And the easiest way to do that, the best way to do that, I believe, is to take their temperature visually, you know, and include them. Make sure that they feel included in what it is you're delivering. Lesson number three, you talked about connecting with your audience and needing to be comfortable um, with constantly creating a connection between yourself and your stories and visualizing. Um, he talked about when you're in front of people and communicating the stories that you, you're telling. Um, in order for you to be more comfortable to visualize one person, just one person that you're telling a story to, instead of it being a room full of people, which can make you a bit anxious and, you know, it can be nerve wracking. Um, he talked about bringing the energy when delivering your story orally in terms of animation and breathing life into your story um, as far as tonality and um, inflection on certain parts of the story, um, the way you emphasize a, a pause in the story or, you know, um, a moment where you want the audience to take in what you've just said and you might pause something like that um next lesson the oral tradition of storytelling is um is is one of the primary building blocks of civilization in the early days it was how all knowledge was passed from one generation to another and that's what brought the aspect of continuity to our lives as a species. The idea that one generation passes its knowledge and information down to the next through storytelling, the idea that what I know about my ancestors 
comes from the stories that I've been told from the time I was a little boy. Alex Haley talking about Roots and his journey of writing the novel Roots. He used to talk about sitting on his grandmother Cynthia's porch in Henning, Tennessee, and hearing the stories in the summer. All of the old ladies in the family would sit and rock and chew and spit tobacco, and they would tell the stories of the family. And inevitably, those stories would get to the original African. They called him the, the old African, Kunta Kinte, who one day was looking for wood to make a drum for his younger brother and was never seen or heard from again. And the importance of Kunta maintaining his identity and maintaining his contact with who he was enabled him to pass that story on to succeeding generations. It's a powerful illustration of the nature of information as it is passed orally. Take the time, if you are able, to sit with the oldest members of your family and get their stories. Have them tell you their stories so that they don't disappear. For me, a lot of the purpose of storytelling is to remind us of who we are and why we're here and what's important to us. And that more than anything else is what gets communicated in the sharing and the telling. It's the idea that as an audience member, I can be the beneficiary of all of that knowledge, all of that wisdom, all of that emotion, right? That it is available to me by the simple act of showing up and being present. Lesson number five, he discusses the importance of oral storytelling. Um, he talked about oral storytelling being the primary building blocks of civilization. If you think back, you know, you always had your stories orally communicated to you um, from when your grandmother read them or your mother read them or that kind of thing. There's always been oral storytelling involved in communicating family histories and um, even made up fairy tales. So he talked about how important it is to have that, that generational thing that you pass down from one generation to the next to tell stories, not just having them read the story themselves, but to communicate it orally and being read to or reading to an audience of people um, or your family. Um, he also emphasized again, maintaining the energy when performing, um, well, when giving your story orally, uh, taking the time to um, practice reading orally before you like just throw yourself out there and, and read orally to an audience full of people, practicing, practicing in front of a mirror. Um, he talked about um, listening being an active skill. Uh, it requires awareness and sometimes good storytelling involves being able to be a good listener as well, to utilize the silences um, that the silences that may be meant to be in the story that you're telling that may not come across, you know, in the written form, but like when you're communicating it orally, you know instinctively that there should be a pause at a certain point. So that there's that silence that you're communicating to the room. Next lesson. I believe that two of the most important words in combination in language are what if. Because by accepting that invitation into the what if, everything becomes possible. And so after that question, in the exploration of that question, all things become possible, right? What if we were able to bridge the divide that separates us 
ideologically, intellectually, emotionally. What if we were able to do that? There's a tendency that we have as human beings to encourage um, an investigation into the what if when we're children. But we remove permission as we get older to imagine and to investigate that what if. I believe that we need to maintain contact with that inquiry. We need to maintain our contact with our imaginations as we grow up and grow older. We can't have a just, equitable society unless we can imagine one. For me, our imagination is a muscle, right? It's a, it's an ability. I guess it, it is kind of like a bicycle. You never lose it, but it's not in tip top condition unless we exercise it, you know? And so the idea of, of nurturing our imaginations, actually nourishing that part of ourselves that is naturally creative is what I'm talking about. I think in order to become a, f a, a productive functioning member of society, you need all of your gifts front and center and certainly need your imagination. Again, nothing that has ever been invented did not begin as a thought in the mind of a human being. That's the absolute truth about the power of our imagination. So it's essential that we nourish that aspect of ourselves because chief among, I think, any other facility we possess, it is our imaginations that is going to sustain us through good times and bad as we move through life. Reading is absolutely the gateway to our imagination. Because when we're reading, we, we are automatically projected into a space where we are creating and co-creating with the word, the reality that we are experiencing. When we read, we make the pictures in our heads, right? We make the movie in our heads. And that's important because without being able to visualize, nothing gets done. You can sit and feel all you want, but it's not gonna build a house. <laughs> it's not gonna put food on the table. You can sit in your feelings all day long and you won't advance your cause one whit. But if you are in your imaginative self, if you are in that space, everything is possible. And the only thing then necessary is right action behind that vision. Through the word, we can be introduced to that which we never contemplated before. And in the act of being introduced to an idea, a concept, a truth that we had never considered before, a whole universe of possibility opens up for us. It's so critical that we develop a healthy relationship with our imagination. I believe that an important part of the, the process of manifestation is uh, your mental attitude. I am, I believe, one of the most positive people I've ever known. I have a just a preternaturally positive outlook on life. And I believe that it has really served me in terms of having my dreams come true, being able to manifest my heart's desire. I think that there is something to the idea of generating a space in our lives where dreams can become reality. I think in terms of manifestation, the universe needs to see your investment. It needs to feel the sincerity of your effort and the intention behind it. And it's, it's that which the universe aligns with, right? 
the universe will always align with the sincerity of your effort and intention. It's just the nature of this space that we occupy. We have to bring our own light to the world in order to see its result, to manifest its like. We have to generate our own sense of optimism and positivity in order to get that feedback from the universe. Judgment is a manifestation killer. Manifestation is largely a, a, a function of cultivating that which we know to be true and then having the courage to put oneself out there. I think that's a piece that a, a lot of us miss is for some of us, our life experience informs us that the world is there to serve us rather than the other way around. I believe we are here to serve the world and that it's our responsibility to seek out experiences that give us the opportunity to render service. I think life is something that has to be thirsted after. We have to seek out life. We have to want to engage and, and, and really have a hunger for the unknown. Lesson number six is the imagination is our superpower. He talked about um, the most important, he said the most important words are what if. Uh, he said that everything becomes possible in the exploration of that question. He suggests that we never grow, outgrow our imagination. He, he said uh, as, as we get older, somehow we seem to remove uh, the imagination of asking, um, of asking what if from our, like our vocabulary, our daily practice. You know, like kids always ask what if, they always ask why, what happens if, you know, that kind of thing. And he's like, sometimes, somehow we outgrow that as we get older. So he suggests we never outgrow that, that imagination, that curiosity, that the inquisitiveness. Um, he talked about the fact that um, imagination isn't necessarily just about like fairy tales and that kind of thing. Imagination, when he speaks about imagination, he means imagining anything is possible. Um, he talked about having an equitable and just society. And he talked about the fact that that's only possible if you can imagine that it's possible. Um, there's, you know, certain things that sometimes seem impossible to you only because you can't imagine it. So imagination is is good on all fronts to, to keep our imagination, to always remember the possibilities that lie in front of us um, if we only imagine that they could happen. He said without being able to visualize, nothing gets done. Reading introduces you to the possibilities you are otherwise unaware of. That was a key point that I took away from that. I, I love that he said that I'm about to write that down somewhere. Um, and he talked about manifestation. He said, your attitude is the key to manifestation. And he said, the universe needs to see your investment, to feel your intensity, your intention, your effort. And that is what helps manifest what we want to become a reality. Uh, yeah, next lesson. <laughs> to remember about speaking in public is that for most of us, it really is a nerve wracking experience. There is a, a phrase that I love using. Fear is simply suppressed excitement. We all have nervousness. I'm nervous every time I speak in public. I'm going to say that again. I've been doing this for 45 years. Every time I open my mouth in public, I'm nervous. But here's the thing. I have developed the ability to not allow my nervousness, my fear, to paralyze me into non-action. 
Okay? So I actually use the fear as information. I know if I'm nervous that I'm engaged. What I'm about to do is important to me. I think the, the day that I stop being nervous before I speak, I will recognize that there's something wrong. I'm disconnected. So it's all just energy. The energy of fear can be transformed by recognition into the energy of suppressed excitement. And suppressed excitement is a lot easier to deal with intellectually than our fear. So the framing of how you are being impacted by your energy is really key. How you allow the mind to interpret it. Should you ever feel like you are in a place where you are overwhelmed? by your fear, overwhelmed by your nervousness, go back to the breath. <sighs> really? Just go back to the breath. Conscious breathing is the quickest way I know of to bring center back to yourself. To bring yourself back to center, just simply take a couple of deep breaths. <sighs> Oxygenate your lungs, right? And if it helps to make a sound, that also releases tension. Ha! It is hard to be tense when you are making a sound like that. Children make sounds like this all the time. They are free in their expression. Pretend you're a child for a second. One of the things that I want you to remember about storytelling is, is that um, the human being, uh, uh, our, our bodies, our senses, we are predisposed to storytelling. So a thing like your rhythm, your timing in terms of your delivery, think of it as music, okay? Um, if you think of your delivery in terms of a song or music, it's easier to understand how the ebbs and flows, the highs and lows, the way you use your voice in connection with your body can help communicate your text, right? Can help communicate your story. The human voice is a really musical instrument. Even when speaking, just in our normal speaking voice, there is a rhythm to it. If you listen closely, there's music there. So tone, intonation, rhythm, right? Emphasis and silence are all tools that we can use to enhance our communication. More happens in the silence than you really think is going on. Because in the silence, you're really inviting the audience to fill in the blank. You see, don't be afraid to use the silence to your benefit. Um, lesson number eight, he talks about performance as a form of storytelling. Um, not just orally communicating a story, but using body language and tone and inflection in your voice. Um, eye communi um, communication with your eyes, um, sometimes in the things we don't say, the energy that you put into the words that you perform, uh, and then he goes into various exercises and things about warming up your body and your voice, um, and says that that is important when you are performing as far as reading a book aloud or reading an excerpt of your book aloud at an event or any kind of um, public forum like that, you need to practice. You need to do certain things vocally to prepare to be reading for a decent length of time. It's not something you can just go into coldly without some type of preparation and practice. So I thought that was very, very important. Next lesson. important to remember that there's a difference between conversation 
and communication. We can talk just to hear ourselves talk or to fill up the void. A lot of us have a discomfort with silence and we talk so that we don't have to suffer the silence. But conversing and communicating are really not the same thing because communicating indicates again an intention to have an exchange. Communicating is more precise, it's more intentional and it's more directed. It's that effort to be aware, to be conscious of the reasons that we're communicating and the manner in which we're communicating, right? Rhythm, tone, expression, all of those things come into play. But at the beginning, the middle and the end of the day, it really is about what is my intention for being engaged in this moment? I believe representation matters because it's really difficult to form a healthy self-image unless you can see yourself reflected in popular culture. I grew up in an era where it was rare to see black people on TV and in magazines. Um, the places where I saw black people represented were on the news, especially during the Vietnam War era where the majority of our soldiers being sent into the theater of war were young black men. And, you know, on TV in less than elevated positions in society. Representation matters. You know, Alex Haley used to say, and I, I know people have said it before him and, and, and many after him, history is written by the winners. He who controls the narrative controls reality. Right? So the notion that there are voices that are a part of the conversation that are absent is exactly why representation matters. This experiment that we are currently engaged in was designed, I believe, to include all of us, that we would not get the full value of being human unless and until we were able to value everyone's contribution. And we haven't gotten there yet. There have been flashes. And so representation has to be at the forefront of, of our experience of storytelling and communicating because we aren't meant to leave anybody out of the conversation. By, by not limiting our individual voices, we are contributing to the great tapestry that, that is storytelling on this planet at this particular time in our history. By not allowing our voices to be silenced, by ensuring that we speak up and speak out, we are staking a claim to a piece of the conversation right? The idea that, that no one can silence my voice that I don't give permission to. I have to cooperate with your ability to silence me today in order for my voice to be unheard. Now, that's important to me because personally, I feel like I have value and I feel like I have something to say. What's more, I feel like you have value and that you have something to say and she has value and she has something to say. I believe we all are a piece of this puzzle. And the only way we're going to put the puzzle together in total is by welcoming all the disparate voices to the table. There is, there is more commonality in humanity than there is difference. We have the same hopes, we have the same dreams, we want safety, security for our families. We thrive on clean air, clean water, and enough nourishing food to eat. 
that doesn't change based on where you were born or what color your skin is or the gender you were assigned at birth. We have this amazing opportunity as human beings to choose, to choose our own path, to choose our direction, to choose our experience. And that's God given. You can't take that away from a person and claim to be human. We all have a contribution to make. And it's incumbent upon us as a society to make room for all of those voices. The act of self-expression is an affirmation that I am here, that I am alive, that I am vital and that I matter. I have decided in my life that I want to stand for what's true. I want to engage in ideas, feelings, actions that are true. And that's the North Star that I use when storytelling. Stories like Roots can help further the, the conversation about justice and equality in this country by the very nature of the truth that they bring to the table, right? Again, I don't believe that America has done a very good job of telling ourselves the true nature of our story. We lie to ourselves an awful lot. The story of black people in America, we didn't come here because we wanted to. We didn't immigrate willfully. We were brought here in chains and then we became an inconvenience to white normative culture and they didn't know what to do with us. And so they continued to oppress us because it made them feel better about their lot in life. Made them feel better about their existence to have someone that they could rely upon that was beneath their stature. That's on you. That's not on me. Yeah, we're all human, we're all fallible, we're all capable of inflicting tremendous pain on one another. And it is never appropriate to ignore it when we do engage in that kind of behavior because we learn nothing from it if we don't acknowledge the truth. We have not acknowledged the truth in America of the systemic, the generational damage that was done. Why? Because it reminds us that we haven't always been at our best. It reminds us that there has been an imbalance, an unfairness that has been enacted in our lives that is inappropriate. But America has not indulged itself in the shame necessary. We haven't acknowledged it. We'd rather ignore it in the hopes that it'll go away, but it won't. In this final lesson, uh, and kind of breaking in between the lesson here uh, before his parting words, but um, he talks about, he tells your story, talks about representation mattering, um, how it matters that you see yourself on a screen or that you see books by people who look like you or um, shows with people who look like you in it and how it's important to have all of the different voices in a room um, when telling stories because no one person's story is ever the same as the next person's story particularly if you come from different backgrounds and um, he talked about how um, it's it, it's very important to remember that when you're trying to include all representations it doesn't mean you're discluding anyone in fact that is the point of making things inclusive and including all points of view 
in the stories that you tell because everyone's story is worth telling. Everyone's story has value. Um, and he talked about if you're not seeing that, if you're not seeing representation from every aspect of um, different people's lives, different cultures, different you know races or whatever, speak up, speak out um, because representation matters and how our children see themselves, how we see ourselves, it matters. And with that, I will leave you with LaVar's parting words. I think that the job of a storyteller is that of a truth teller. You gotta bring the truth. You have to be willing to stand in your truth and express it. Because if you don't, it just gives people permission to forget, to ignore, to obfuscate, to change the narrative. I think a part, I feel like a part of my journey in this lifetime is to remind us of the truth of the black experience in America. Part of my journey is to remind us of the power and potential of our imaginations as they are expressed in science fiction and thoughts, contemplations on the future. I feel like part of my destiny is to be here and stand for literacy, for the, for knowledge, for learning, especially where children are concerned because they are the most vulnerable among us and they are what this is all about. Those who take over when our time is done. So that now at this point in my life, this point in my journey, I feel like I have valuable stories to share. And when I do this, when I do my job, I really feel the rightness of who I am and why I'm here. And there's no better feeling than that. Not for me anyway to feel the rightness of who I am and what I'm doing. And there you have it. That is LeVar Burton's masterclass. Um, I hope it was as wonderful for you as I thought it was. I got a lot out of this class. Um, I, I may not be so afraid to, uh, read my stuff in, in events in the future um because as i said before the thought of that has always terrified me um i don't like the sound of my voice i don't like my reading voice either so just but i think i could take some of the tips and practices that he gave throughout this class and um think i i could could make something work and it was important how he talked about practicing and i I don't know why I never thought that you should practice if you're going to read a story or poem or anything out loud. Practice, of course, of course you should practice. Yep, didn't dawn on me at all. But <laughs> anyway, I hope that you got a lot out of this masterclass. Um, hope you got as much as I did. If you have a subscription, please take the class. It's amazing. And that's going to be it for this video. If you like what you see and you want to see more videos from me, make sure that you hit the like and subscribe button. I post videos on Mondays and Thursdays, a live stream on Wednesdays from 7 to 9 p.m. And um, I will be putting another poll for the next masterclass on the community tab. So stay tuned and be on the lookout there to vote for the next masterclass that I do. As per usual, if you would like to support me in any of my creative endeavors, such as my blog site, my online magazine, my online store, or my Kofi page, all of those links can be found in the description box below. And until next time, have a blessed day. Bye.